character. The sun set, but set not his hope. Stars rose, his faith was earlier up. Fixed on the enormous galaxy, deeper and older seemed his eye, and matched his sufferance sublime the taciturnity of time. He spoke, and words more soft than rain brought the age of gold again. His action won such reverence sweet as hid all measure of the feet. Work of his hand he nor commends nor grieves, pleads for itself the fact, as unrepenting nature leaves her every act. I have read that those who listened to Lord Chatham felt that there was something finer in the man than anything which he said. It has been complained of our brilliant English historian of the French Revolution, that when he has told all his facts about Mirabeau, they do not justify his estimate of his genius. The Gracchi, Agus, Cleomenes, and others of Plutarch's heroes do not in the record of facts equal their own fame. Sir Philip Sidney, the Earl of Essex, Sir Walter Raleigh, are men of great figure, and of few deeds. We cannot find the smallest part of the personal weight of Washington in the narrative of his exploits. The authority of the name of Schiller is too great for his books. This inequality of the reputation to the works or anecdotes is not accounted for by saying that the reverberation is longer than the thunderclap, but somewhat resided in these men which begot an expectation that outran all their performance. The largest part of their power was latent. This is that which we call character, a reserved force which acts directly by presence and without means. It is conceived of as a certain undemonstrable force, a familiar or genius, by whose impulses the man is guided but whose counsels he cannot impart, which is company for him, so that such men are often solitary, or, if they chance to be social, do not need society, but can entertain themselves very well alone. The purest literary talent appears at one time great, at another time small, but character is of a stellar and undiminishable greatness. What others affect by talent or by eloquence this man accomplishes by some magnetism. Half his strength he put not forth. His victories are by demonstration of superiority, and not by crossing of bayonets. He conquers because his arrival alters the face of affairs. Oh, Ioli, how did you know that Hercules was a god? Because, answered Ioli, I was content the moment my eyes fell on him. When I beheld Theseus, I desired that I might see him offer battle, or at least guide his horses in the chariot race. But Hercules did not wait for a contest. He conquered whether he stood, or walked, or sat, or whatever thing he did. Man, ordinarily a pendant to events, only half attached, and that awkwardly, to the world he lives in, in these examples appears to share the life of things, and to be an expression of the same laws which control the tides in the sun, numbers, and quantities. But to use a more modest illustration, and nearer home, I observe that in our political elections, where this element, if it appears at all, can only occur in its coarsest form, we sufficiently understand its incomparable rate. The people know that they need in their representative much more than talent, namely the power to make his talent trusted. They cannot come at their ends by sending to Congress a learned, acute, and fluent speaker if he be not one who, before he was appointed by the people to represent him, was appointed by Almighty God to stand for a fact, invincibly persuaded of that fact in himself, so that the most confident and the most violent persons learn that here is resistance on which both impudence and terror are wasted, namely faith in a fact. The men who carry their points do not need to inquire of their constituents what they should say, but are themselves the country which they represent. Nowhere are its emotions or opinions so instant and true as in them, nowhere so pure from selfish infusion. The constituency at home hearkens to their words, watches the color of their cheek, and therein, as in a glass, dresses its own. Our public assemblies are pretty good tests of manly force. 
our frank countrymen of the West and South have a taste for character, and like to know whether the New Englander is a substantial man, or whether the hand can pass through him. The same motive force appears in trade. There are geniuses in trade, as well as in war, or the state, or letters. And the reason why this or that man is fortunate is not to be told. It lies in the man. That is all anybody can tell you about it. See him, and you will know as easily why he succeeds, as if you see Napoleon, you would comprehend his fortune. In the new objects we recognize the old game, the habit of fronting the fact, and not dealing with it at second hand, through the perceptions of somebody else. Nature seems to authorize trade as soon as you see the natural merchant, who appears not so much a private agent as her factor and minister of commerce. His natural probity combines with his insight into the fabric of society to put him above tricks, and he communicates to all his own faith that contracts are of no private interpretation. The habit of his mind is a reference to standards of natural equity and public advantage, and he inspires respect and the wish to deal with him, both for the quiet spirit of honor which attends him, and for the intellectual pastime which the spectacle of so much ability affords. This immensely stretched trade, which makes the capes of the southern ocean his wharves, and the Atlantic Sea his familiar port, centers in his brain only, and nobody in the universe can make his place good. In his parlor I see very well that he has been at hard work this morning, with that knitted brow and that settled humor, which all his desire to be courteous cannot shake off. I see plainly how many firm acts have been done, how many valiant no's have this day been spoken, when others would have uttered ruinous yeas. I see with the pride of art and skill of masterly arithmetic and power of remote combination the consciousness of being an agent and playfellow of the original laws of the world. He too believes that none can supply him and that a man must be born to trade, or he cannot learn it. This virtue draws the mind more when it appears in action to ends not so mixed. It works with most energy in the smallest companies and in private relations. In all cases it is an extraordinary and incomputable agent. The excess of physical strength is paralyzed by it. Higher natures overpower lower ones by affecting them with a certain sleep. The faculties are locked up, and offer no resistance. Perhaps that is the universal law. When the high cannot bring up the low to itself, it benumbs it, as man charms down the resistance of the lower animals. Men exert on each other a similar occult power. How often has the influence of a true master realized all the tales of magic? A river of command seemed to run down from his eyes into all those who beheld him, a torrent of strong, sad light, like an Ohio or Danube, which pervaded them with his thoughts, and colored all events with the hue of his mind. "'What means did you employ?' was the question asked of the wife of Concini, in regard to her treatment of Mary of Medici. And the answer was, "'Only that influence which every strong mind has over a weak one. Cannot Caesar in irons shuffle off the irons and transfer them to the person of Hippo or Thraso the turnkey? Is an iron handcuff so immutable a bond? Suppose a slaver on the coast of Guinea should take on board a gang of negroes which should contain persons of the stamp of Toussaint L'Overture, or let us fancy under those swarthy masks he has a gang of Washingtons in chains. When they arrive at Cuba, will the relative order of the ship's company be the same? Is there nothing but rope and iron? Is there no love, no reverence? Is there never a glimpse of right in a poor slave-captain's mind? And cannot these be supposed available to break or elude, or in any manner overmatch the tension of an inch or two of iron ring? This is a natural power, like light and heat, and all nature cooperates with it. The reason we feel one man's presence and do not feel another's is as simple as gravity. Truth is the summit of being, justice is the application of it to affairs. All individual natures stand in a scale, according to the purity of this element in them. 
The will of the pure runs down from them into other natures, as water runs down from a higher into a lower vessel. This natural force is no more to be withstood than any natural force. We can drive a stone upward for a moment into the air, but it is yet true that all stones will forever fall, and whatever instances can be quoted of unpunished theft, or of a lie which somebody credited, justice must prevail, and it is the privilege of truth to make itself believed. Character is this moral order seen through the medium of an individual nature. An individual is an encloser. Time and space, liberty and necessity, truth and thought, are left at large no longer. Now the universe is a close or pound. All things exist in the man tinged with the manners of his soul. With what quality is in him he infuses all nature that he can reach, nor does he tend to lose himself in vastness, but how long a curve soever, all his regards return into his own good at last. He animates all he can, and sees only what he animates. He encloses the world, as a patriot does his country, as a material basis for his character, and a theatre for action. A healthy soul stands united with the just and the true, as the magnet arranges itself with the pole, so that he stands to all beholders like a transparent object betwixt them and the sun, and whoso journeys towards the sun journeys towards that person. He is thus the medium of the highest influence to all who are not on the same level. Thus men of character are the conscience of the society to which they belong. The natural measure of this power is the resistance of circumstances. Impure men consider life as it is reflected in opinions, events, and persons. They cannot see the action until it is done. Yet its moral element pre-existed in the actor, and its quality as right or wrong it was easy to predict. Everything in nature is bipolar, or has a positive and negative pole. There is a male and a female, a spirit and a fact, a north and a south. Spirit is the positive, the event is the negative. Will is the north, action the south pole. Character may be ranked as having its natural place in the north. It shares the magnetic currents of the system. The feeble souls are drawn to the south, or negative pole. They look at the profit or hurt of the action. They never behold a principle until it is lodged in a person. They do not wish to be lovely, but to be loved. Men of character like to hear of their faults. The other class do not like to hear of faults. They worship events, secure to them a fact, a connection, a certain chain of circumstances, and they will ask no more. The hero sees that the event is ancillary. It must follow him. A given order of events has no power to secure to him the satisfaction which the imagination attaches to it. The soul of goodness escapes from any set of circumstances. Whilst prosperity belongs to a certain mind, and will introduce that power and victory which is its natural fruit, a given order of events has no power to secure to him the satisfaction which the imagination attaches to it. The soul of goodness escapes from any set of circumstances, whilst prosperity belongs to a certain mind, and will introduce that power and victory which is its natural fruit into any order of events. No change of circumstances can repair a defect of character. We boast our emancipation from many suggestions, but if we have broken any idols, it is through a transfer of the idolatry. What have I gained that I no longer immolate a bull to Jove or to Neptune, or a mouse to Hecate, that I do not tremble before the Eumenides, or the Catholic Purgatory, or the Calvinist Judgment Day? If I quake at opinion, the public opinion as we call it, or at the threat of assault, or contumely, or bad neighbors, or poverty, or mutilation, or at the rumor of revolution, or of murder, if I quake, what matters it what I quake at? Our proper vice takes form in one or another shape, according to the sex, age, or temperament of the person, and if we are capable of fear, we readily find terrors. The covetousness or the malignity which saddens me when I ascribe it to society is my own. I am always environed by myself. On the other part, rectitude is a perpetual victory. 
celebrated not by cries of joy, but by serenity, which is joy fixed or habitual. It is disgraceful to fly to events for confirmation of our truth and worth. The capitalist does not run every hour to the broker to coin his advantages into current money of the realm. He is satisfied to read in the quotations of the market that his stocks have risen. The same transport which the occurrence of the best events in the best order would occasion me, I must learn to taste purer in the perception that my position is every hour meliorated, and does already command those events I desire. That exultation is only to be checked by the foresight of an order of things so excellent as to throw all our prosperities into the deepest shade. The face which character wears to me is self-sufficingness. I revere the person who is riches, so that I cannot think of him as alone, or poor, or exiled, or unhappy, or a client, but as perpetual patron, benefactor, and beatified man. Character is centrality the impossibility of being displaced or overset. A man should give us a sense of mass. Society is frivolous, and shreds its day into scraps, its conversation into ceremonies and escapes. But if I go to see an ingenious man, I shall think myself poorly entertained if he give me nimble pieces of benevolence and etiquette. Rather he shall stand stoutly in his place, and let me apprehend if it were only his resistance know that I have encountered a new and positive quality, great refreshment for both of us. It is much that he does not accept the conventional opinions and practices, that nonconformity will remain a goad and remembrancer, and every inquirer will have to dispose of him in the first place. There is nothing real or useful that is not a seat of war. Our houses ring with laughter and personal and critical gossip, but it helps little. But the uncivil, unavailable man, who is a problem and a threat to society, whom it cannot let pass in silence but must either worship or hate, and to whom all parties feel related, both the leaders of opinion and the obscure and eccentric, he helps. He puts America and Europe in the wrong, and destroys the skepticism which says, Man is a doll, let us eat and drink, tis the best we can do, by illuminating the untried and unknown. Acquiescence in the establishment and appeal to the public indicate infirm faith, heads which are not clear, and which must see a house built before they can comprehend the plan of it. The wise man not only leaves out his thought the many, but leaves out the few. Fountains, the self-moved, the absorbed, the commander because he is commanded, the assured, the primary, they are good for these announce the instant presence of supreme power. Our action should rest mathematically on our substance. In nature there are no false valuations. A pound of water in the ocean tempest has no more gravity than in a midsummer pond. All things work exactly according to their quality and according to their quantity, attempt nothing they cannot do, except man only. He has pretension. He wishes and attempts things beyond his force. I read in a book of English memoirs, Mr. Fox, afterwards Lord Holland, said he must have the treasury. He had served up to it and would have it. Xenophon and his ten thousand were quite equal to what they attempted and did it, so equal that it was not suspected to be a grand and inimitable exploit. Yet there stands that fact unrepeated, a high-water mark in military history. Many have attempted it since, and not been equal to it. It is only on reality that any power of action can be based. No institution will be better than the institutor. I knew an amiable and accomplished person who undertook a practical reform, yet I was never able to find in him the enterprise of love he took in hand. He adopted it by ear, and by the understanding from the books he had been reading. All his action was tentative a piece of the city carried out into the fields, and was the city still, and no new fact, and could not inspire enthusiasm. Had there been something latent in the man, a terrible undemonstrated genius agitating and embarrassing his demeanor, we had watched for its advent. It is not enough that the intellect should see the evils and their remedy. 
we shall still postpone our existence, nor take the ground to which we are entitled, whilst it is only a thought and not a spirit that incites us. We have not yet served up to it. These are properties of life. And another trait is the notice of incessant growth. Men should be intelligent and earnest. They must also make us feel that they have a controlling, happy future opening before them, whose early twilights already kindle in the passing hour. The hero is misconceived and misreported. He cannot, therefore, wait to unravel any man's blunders. He is again on his road, adding new powers and honors to his domain and new claims on your heart, which will bankrupt you if you have loitered about the old things and have not kept your relation to him by adding to your wealth. New actions are the only apologies and explanations of old ones which the noble can bear to offer or to receive. If your friend has displeased you, you shall not sit down to consider it, for he has already lost all memory of the passage, and has doubled his power to serve you, and ere you can rise up again will burden you with blessings. We have no pleasure in thinking of a benevolence that is only measured by its works. Love is inexhaustible, and if its estate is wasted, its granary emptied, still cheers and enriches, and the man, though he sleep, seems to purify the air and his house to adorn the landscape and strengthen the laws. People always recognize the difference. We know who is benevolent by quite other means than the amount of subscription to soup societies. It is only low merits that can be enumerated. Fear when your friends say to you what you have done well, and say it through. But when they stand with uncertain timid looks of respect and half-dislike, and must suspend their judgment for years to come, you may begin to hope. Therefore it was droll in the good Reamer, who has written memoirs of Goethe, to make out a list of his donations and good deeds, as so many hundred dollars given to Stilling, to Hegel, to Tischbein, a lucrative place found for Professor Foss, a post under the Grand Duke of Herder, a pension for Meyer, two professors recommended to foreign universities, etc., etc. The longest list of specifications of benefit would look very short. A man is a poor creature if he is to be measured so, for all these, of course, are exceptions and the rule and the hodiernal life of a good man is benefaction. The true charity of Goethe is to be inferred from the account he gave Dr. Eckerman of the way in which he had spent his fortune. Each bon mot of mine has cost a purse of gold, half a million of my own money, the fortune I inherited, my salary, and the large income derived from my writings for fifty years back, have been expected to instruct me in what I now know. I have besides seen, etc., etc. I own it is poor chat and gossip to go to enumerate traits of this simple and rapid power, and we are painting the lightning with charcoal. But in these long nights and vacations I like to console myself so. Nothing but itself can copy it. A word warm from the heart enriches me. I surrender at discretion. How death-cold is literary genius before this fire of life! These are the touches that reanimate my heavy soul, and give it eyes to pierce the dark of nature. I find, where I thought myself poorer, there was I most rich. Thence comes a new intellectual exaltation, to be again rebuked by some new exhibition of character. Strange alternation of attraction and repulsion! Character repudiates intellect, yet excites it, and character passes into thought, is published so, and then is ashamed before new flashes of moral worth. Character is nature in its highest form. It is of no use to ape it or to contend with it. Somewhat is possible of resistance and of persistence and of creation to this power, which will foil all emulation. This masterpiece is best where no hands but nature's have been laid on it. Care is taken that the greatly destined shall slip into life in the shade, with no thousand-eyed Athens to watch and blazon every new thought, every blushing emotion of young genius. Two persons lately, very young children of the Most High God, have given me occasion for thought. When I explored the source of their sanctity and charm for the imagination, 
It seemed as if each answered, From my nonconformity. I never listened to your people's law, or what they call their gospel, and wasted my time. I was content with the simple rural poverty of my own. Hence this sweetness. My work never reminds you of that, is pure of that. And nature advertises me in such persons that in democratic America she will not be democratized. How cloistered and constitutionally sequestered from the market and from scandal. It was only this morning that I sent away some wild flowers of these wood gods. They are a relief from literature, these fresh draughts from the sources of thought and sentiment, as we read, in an age of polish and criticism, the first lines of written prose and verse of a nation. How captivating is their devotion to their favorite books, whether Aeschylus, Dante, Shakespeare, or Scott, as feeling that they have a stake in that book. Who touches that, touches them, and especially the total solitude of the critic, the patmos of thought from which he writes, in unconsciousness of any eyes that shall ever read this writing. Could they dream on still as angels, and not wake to comparisons and to be flattered? Yet some natures are too good to be spoiled by praise, and whatever the vein of thought reaches down into the profound, there is no danger from vanity. Solemn friends may warn them of the danger of their heads being turned by the flourish of trumpets, but they can afford to smile. I remember the indignation of an eloquent Methodist at the kind admonitions of a doctor of divinity. My friend, a man can neither be praised nor insulted. But forgive the counsels. They are very natural. I remember the thought which occurred to me when some ingenious and spiritual foreigners came to America was, Have you been victimized in being brought hither? Or, prior to that, answer me this, Are you victimizable? As I have said, nature keeps these sovereignties in her own hands, and however pertly our sermons and disciplines can divide some share of credit, and teach that the laws fashion the citizen, she goes her own gait, and puts the wisest in the wrong. She makes very light of gospels and prophets, as one who has a great many more to produce, and no excess of time to spare on any one. There is a class of men, individuals of which appear at long intervals, so eminently involved with insight and virtue, that they have been unanimously saluted as divine, and who seem to be an accumulation of that power we consider. Divine persons are character-born, or to borrow a phrase from Napoleon, they are victory-organized. They are usually received with ill-will, because they are new, and because they set a bound to the exaggeration that has been made of the personality of the last divine person. Nature never rhymes her children, never makes two men alike. When we see a great man, we fancy a resemblance to some historical person, and predict the sequel of his character and fortune, a result which he is sure to disappoint. None will ever solve the problem of his character according to our prejudice, but only in his own high unprecedented way. Character wants room must not be crowded on by persons, nor be judged from glimpses caught in the press of affairs or on few occasions. It needs perspective as a great building. It may not, probably does not, form relations rapidly, and we should not require rash explanation, either on the popular ethics or on our own, of its action. I look on sculpture as history. I do not think the Apollo and the Jove impossible in flesh and blood. Every trait which the artist recorded in stone he had seen in life, and better than his copy. We have seen many counterfeits, but we are born believers in great men. How easily we read in old books, when men were few, of the smallest action of the patriarchs. We require that a man should be so large and columnar in the landscape, that it should deserve to be recorded that he arose and girded up his loins and departed to such a place. The most credible pictures are those of majestic men who prevailed at their entrance and convinced the senses, as happened to the Eastern magician who was sent to test the merits of Zertusht or Zoroaster. When the Yunani sage arrived at Balkh, the Persians tell us, Gushtasp appointed a day on which the Mobeds of every country should assemble, 
and a golden chair was placed for the Yunani sage. Then the beloved of Yezdam, the prophet Zertusht, advanced into the midst of the assembly. The Yunani sage, on seeing that chief, said, This form and this gait cannot lie, and nothing but truth can proceed from them. Plato said it was impossible not to believe in the children of the gods, though they should speak without probable or necessary arguments. I should think myself very unhappy in my associates if I could not credit the best things in history. John Bradshaw, said Milton, appears like a consul, from which the faces are not to depart with the year, so that not on the tribunal only, but throughout his life you would regard him as sitting in judgment upon kings. I find it more credible, since it is anterior information, that one man should know heaven, as the Chinese say, than that so many men should know the world. The virtuous prince confronts the gods without any misgiving. He waits a hundred ages till a sage comes, and does not doubt. He who confronts the gods without any misgiving knows heaven. He who waits a hundred ages until a sage comes without knowing knows men. Hence the virtuous prince moves, and for ages shows empire the way. The coldest precision cannot go abroad without encountering inexplicable influences. One man fastens an eye on him, and the graves of the memory render up their dead. The secrets that make him wretched either to keep or to betray must be yielded. Another, and he cannot speak, and the bones of his body seem to lose their cartilages, the entrance of a friend adds grace, boldness, and eloquence to him, and there are persons he cannot choose but remember, who give a transcendent expansion to his thought, and kindled another life in his bosom. What is so excellent as strict relations of amity, when they spring from this deep root? The sufficient reply to the skeptic who doubts the power and the furniture of man is in that possibility of joyful intercourse with persons which makes the faith and practice of all reasonable men. I know nothing which life has to offer so satisfying as the profound good understanding which can subsist after much exchange of good offices between two virtuous men, each of whom is sure of himself and sure of his friend. It is a happiness which postpones all other gratifications and makes politics and commerce and churches cheap. For when man shall meet as they ought, each a benefactor, a shower of stars, clothed with thoughts, with deeds, with accomplishments, it should be the festival of nature which all things announce. Of such friendship love in the sexes is the first symbol, as all other things are symbols of love. Those relations to the best men which at one time we reckoned the romances of youth, become in the progress of the character the most solid enjoyment. If it were possible to live in right relations with men, if we could abstain from asking anything of them, from asking their praise or help or pity, and content us with compelling them through the virtue of the eldest laws, could we not deal with a few persons, with one person, after the unwritten statutes, and make an experiment of their efficacy? Could we not pay our friend the compliment of truth, of silence, of forbearing? Need we be so eager to seek him? If we are related, we shall meet. It was a tradition of the ancient world that no metamorphosis could hide a god from a god, and there is a Greek verse which runs, The gods are to each other not unknown. Friends also follow the laws of divine necessity. They gravitate to each other, and cannot otherwise. When each the other shall avoid, shall each by each be most enjoyed. Their relation is not made, but allowed. The gods must seat themselves without seneschal in our Olympus, and as they can install themselves by seniority divine. Society is spoiled if pains are taken if the associates are brought a mile to meet. And if it be not society, it is a mischievous, low, degrading jangle, though made up of the best. All the greatness of each is kept back, and every foible in painful activity, as if the Olympians should meet to exchange snuff-boxes. Life goes headlong. 
We chase some flying scheme, or we are haunted by some fear or command behind us. But if suddenly we encounter a friend, we pause. Our heat and hurry look foolish enough. Now pause, now possession is required, and the power to swell the moment from the resources of the heart. The moment is all, in all noble relations. A divine person is the prophecy of the mind. A friend is the hope of the heart. Our beatitude waits for the fulfillment of these two in one. The ages are opening this moral force. All force is the shadow or symbol of that. Poetry is joyful and strong as it draws its inspiration thence. Men write their names on the world as they are filled with this. History has been mean. Our nations have been mobs. We have never seen a man. The divine form we do not yet know, but only the dream and prophecy of such. We do not know the majestic manners which belong to him, which appease and exalt the beholder. We shall one day see that the most private is the most public energy, that quality atones for quantity, and grandeur of character acts in the dark and succors them who never saw it. What greatness has yet appeared is beginnings and encouragements to us in this direction. The history of those gods and saints which the world has written and then worshipped are documents of character. The ages have exulted in the manners of a youth who owed nothing to fortune, and who was hanged in the Tyburn of his nation, and who by the pure quality of his nature shed an epic splendor around the facts of his death which has transfigured every particular into an universal symbol for the eyes of mankind. This great defeat is hitherto our highest fact. But the mind requires a victory to the senses, a force of character which will convert judge, jury, soldier, and king, which will rule animal and mineral virtues, and blend with the courses of sap, of rivers, of winds, of stars, and of moral agents. If we cannot attain at a bound to these grandeurs, at least let us do them homage. In society, high advantages are set down to the possessor as disadvantages. It requires the more wariness in our private estimates. I do not forgive in my friends the failure to know a fine character and to entertain it with thankful hospitality. When at last that which we have always longed for is arrived and shines on us with glad rays out of that far celestial land, then to be coarse, then to be critical and treat such a visitant with the jabber and suspicion of the streets, argues a vulgarity that seems to shut the doors of heaven. This is confession, this is the right insanity, when the soul no longer knows its own, nor where its allegiance, its religion, are due. Is there any religion but this, to know that wherever in the wide desert of being the holy sentiment we cherish has opened into a flower, it blooms for me? If none sees it, I see it. I am aware, if I alone, of the greatness of the fact. Whilst it blooms, I will keep Sabbath or holy time, and suspend my gloom and my folly and jokes. Nature is indulged by the presence of this guest. There are many eyes that can detect and honor the prudent and household virtues. There are many that can discern genius on his starry track, though the mob is incapable. But when that love which is all-suffering, all-abstaining, all-aspiring, which has vowed to itself that it will be a wretch and also a fool in this world sooner than soil its white hands by any compliances, comes into our streets and houses, only the pure and aspiring can know its face, and the only compliment they can pay it is to own it.